Okay. Okay, thank you. The, welcome everybody for today's IMP Mathematical Physics Seminar. So we have a pleasure to, to have Pavel Nurovsky uh, and he's going to, to let us know about split the real form of a Lie group G2, simple, exceptional, and naturally appearing in physics. Pavel? Thank you. Thank you very much. I again ask again, can you hear me? Just please say yes. Yes, very good. Thank you. Perfect. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I was asked by uh, Jan Derezinski to tell you something about Lie group G2 and how it appears in physics. Uh, and I just um, decided to make my talk very did didactic. So there will be a lot of very simple information for, for, for the for majority of the talk, but eventually I will come to something much more complicated. So let me start my talk, which is uh, which has the following goal. The goal of this talk is to provide a physical realization of an ex exceptional simple Lie group D2. Actually, I will show how to realize the split real form of this group as a symmetry group of simple mechanical system. Okay. So uh, let me start from this, that one of the most spectacular achievements of algebra and perhaps the whole mathematics is the classification of simple Lie groups. This result is of Wilhelm Killing, uh, which he published in 1887. It, it, for me, an interesting thing is that at that, at that time, Killing was in nowadays Poland, in, this, in the city of Braniewo in Warmia, when he, when he was a teacher and director of Lyceum there. So what Killing has established is the list of pairwise, pairwise non-equivalent simple Lie algebras. And here is the list. So first we have the classical uh, simple Lie algebras. And these are these algebras like AN, BN, CN, DN, and all of them are algebras that correspond to Lie groups preserving multilinear forms in RN. So this these groups like BN and DN and CN are groups that, uh, that preserves uh, quadratic forms, the BN and DN symmetric quadratic and CN uh, anti-symmetric quadratic, and AN is a group preserving a, a volume form and a, a form of maximal degree. So, and these, 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 these groups in this, or these Lie algebras in this, in this, in this um, uh, series, A, N, B, N, C, N, D, N, they, they are in series, in each series, there's infinitely many of them. So there are infinitely many of them and they are grouped in infinite series parameterized by the Lie theoretic invariant number N, which is just this small N here, uh, called the rank of the simple Lie algebra. Okay, so that was, the, and these algebras were essentially known to such people like Killing and Lee and Engel. They knew that these, these are so, and when Killing tried to classify them, he was believing that these are all. But his greatest discovery was that actually there are a few more, and there is a finite number of them. Actually, there are five more simple Lie algebras. And since they are not in infinite series and there are precisely five, five of them, they are called exceptional simple Lie algebras. And their basic properties are listed in the following table. So what is, since there are only five of them, so there are some distinguished dimensions of these algebras and the largest of them has dimension 248. The, 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 the smallest one has dimension 14, and this smallest one with dimension 14 is called G2. And what happens that these algebras, when Killing classified the simple Lie algebras, he, he, he just was able to show that he couldn't exclude that such five additional ones exist. He said, okay, he had some theoretic theoretical machinery to tell, to, to exclude a lot. And then he realized that there are five, five left that may exist. And due to his theory, they, they should exist, but he was unable to give their realization. So 
killing, as I said, killing did not obtain realization of the smallest of, of not of not of, of any of those, but he in particular, now I will be just interested in the smallest of this uh, exceptional simple real algebra. So he, he didn't obtain realization, but already in 1987, he claimed that it should be realized as a Lie algebra of a transformation group in dimension five. So he knew that if this algebra exists and the corresponding Lie group exists, this corresponding Lie group can be realized as a, as a transformation group on a manifold of dimension five. So let me, let me now try to tell you why he could get this number five. So the simplest way of realizing a Lie group geometrically is to provide a space which is g-homogeneous. Then the group is the symmetry group of the space. And in particular, it is a symmetry of the entire stru structure carried by this homogeneous space M. Such g-homogeneous spaces are always locally equivalent to one of the coset spaces, G divided by P, with P being some Lie subgroup of G. So now the following is true, that if we have any Lie group G and a closed subgroup P, then we look at the homogeneous space, then we relate the dimensions of homogeneous space to the dimension of group and the subgroup, uh, which is the, the isotropic group, right? So if we would like to find the smallest possible dimension of realization of, 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 of this G symmetric structure, we have to choose the largest subgroup of the group. So as I said, so to find the realization of G in the lowest dimension, one has to take a subgroup P in G of the largest dimension. So Killing's remark that G2 should be realized in dimension five, means that he knew that there are subgroups in G2 of dimension nine. G2 is dimension 14. So if there is homogeneous space of dimension five, there should be some subgroup of dimension nine in G2. So let me now pass to this. Uh, how to analyze the group G2? One analyzes due, it due to something which is called a root diagram. And it is, this, this, this subscript two, which is the rank of G2 is particularly convenient for that. So as I said, in studying G2, its rank is particularly convenient. It's rank equal to two. This is because the structure of a simple Lie group G of rank N can be encoded in a graph on the Euclidean hyperplane of dimension N. So since here N is equal to this graph, okay, this graph is called root diagram of G. So here, for G2, the, the rank is equal to, so the structure of Lie group G2 can be viewed on a planar, planar graph. So the root diagram for G2, as discovered by Peeling, looks as follows. So let me now, this is a nice picture of a root diagram, and I will now tell you a few words about root diagrams in case you don't know what it is. So, <clears throat> I claim that in such a picture, especially for G2, essentially all information about Lie algebra of G2 is encoded. So let me, so there is this picture. So the first thing is how to remember the picture. As I said, my talk is very didactic. So how to remember the G2 root diagram. So one way of doing this is as follows. Just consider the star of David. Then on the star of David, put dots in all vertices and in all points that the, the, the lines cross of the star of David and put two dots in, 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 the, in the center of the star of David. In this way, you will get 14 dots. This 14 corresponds to dimension 14 of the, of, of the Lie algebra G2. And now if you just forget about star of David, and just put the lines that what you get is the root diagram of G2. So it is how to remember how the root diagram for G2 looks like, that at least how I remember. And it was told to me by a Mexican Jewish mathematician, Gilbor. Okay, so that's, that's how, the, how to remember root diagram for G2 and why, why it is, what it is good for. So, Given, given a root diagram, 
uh, of a simply algebra, one can very easily see the commutators between the generators of the of the of the Lie algebra. So in particular, so in particular on the root diagram, the fourteen, the, the twelve vectors that that are that are here, the the twelve vectors that are in the root diagram corresponds to twelve generators of the algebra, and there are two other generators which just are hidden here in the in the in the zero. So they, there are these two dots which are just two zero vectors. So actually, all together you have fourteen vectors. Two of them are zero vectors. Uh, 12 of them are non-zero vectors, six of them have uh, given lens and another six another lens, and they are given like this. And now the commutator between commutators between between the, the generators are such that you if you want to have, for example, commutator between the generator alpha 11 and alpha 10, you add these two vectors as vectors on the plane. And what you get, of course, is this one. And then the, 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 the story or the theory of these root diagrams tells you that it is the direction of the commutator of the vector alpha 10, alpha 11. So the, the commutators on the root diagram are such that they, for the planar, for, 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 for Lie algebras with, with rank two, the, the commutator is just addition in Euclidean two space of vectors that that represent the 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 the, the uh, generators, and uh, if you add such two vectors and their sum belongs to the the diagram, then the commutator of the two vectors is just along this this, this line. But if the sum of two vectors like here is does not belong to the diagram that means that these two generators commute so that's how you encode the the commutation relations for example commutation relation between the blue and blue is yellow here commutation relation between this yellow and this yellow is just zero and so on this blue and this blue is this yellow this blue and this blue is this yellow so you see here how to on the diagram, you see how the commutation relation looks like. So it is why it is very useful tool. And in particular, uh, with these preparations, one can see subalgebras in G2. They correspond to the sets of the roots that are closed with respect of addition of vectors in the diagram, right? So for example, one can see here very easily SL2 the algebra, because this blue vector and the opposite blue vector, when you add them, you you land in the zero, and if you add zero to this, you still are here. So that's definitely free, free algebra, uh, a three-dimensional the algebra. It is closed with respect to commutator, and that's representation of SL2R. You can see that there is a, there, there, there is plenty of SL2Rs because there is, for example, any two opposite vectors give uh, SL2R, and there are two there are there are two classes of this SL2R. There are these two SL2Rs corresponding to long roots. And to S and SL2Rs corresponding to short roots. So, for example, the commutator with this, with this is zero. This is again, again SL2R in 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 uh, uh, G2. Um, my goal is to see large algebra, large large subalgebras. So, for example, here, if we just consider the red uh, vectors, the, all the all the long vectors, which is six of them, and two zero vectors from this, which is called Cartan subalgebra, we again see that we have an eight dimensional subalgebra here, because for example, commutator of D of alpha six with alpha one is zero, but for example, commutator of alpha one with alpha 13 is alpha six. And this is close, this red thing is just close with respect to addition of these vectors and adding them, you will be just jumping uh, from these reds to reds sometimes into zero, which are just these two other things. And this is the representation of uh, an algebra of SL3R sitting in G2. Actually, what you have here, you have a root diagram of SL3R because SL3R is also an algebra of rank two. So this red thing, you, not only you see here the root diagram of G2, but you see SL3R sitting in G2, okay? 
So that's that's uh, that's how you can see, for example, SL3R. I want to find this five-dimensional real realization of G2. So somehow I would like to see if there is any nine-dimensional subalgebra. So if we just go to the next page, we see that now, for example, on the left-hand side, you have this, this um, part of the diagram, which is totally in red. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vectors plus two in the, in the, in the Cartan subalgebra. So you have nine. So there's nine guys here. And obviously, if you'll be adding the reds to reds, you will not go to the black. So that's a subalgebra. And so, you, so here is one, one example of a nine dimensional subalgebra in G2. And here is another one. It's quite different because, as you see, here the first the, the, the thing ad adjacent to, 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 the, to the black ones are co consisting of long roots, and here with the blue roots. And it's again. So there are two, at least two quite different nine dimensional subalgebras in G2. I call them P1 and P2. Uh, and they are, from the picture, it is visible that they are quite different. And actually, you can prove that they are non-equivalent respect to the conjugation in G2. These subalgebras in, in this simple Lie algebra G2, this red one here and the blue one here, are actually particular kind of subalgebras. They are called parabolic subalgebras in G2. What is a parabolic subalgebra in a, in a simple Lie algebra or even semi-simple? Parabolic subalgebra is a subalgebra whose killing orthogonal complement is nilpotent, whatever it means, but that's, that's, that's the, the quickest definition, but it is not important. The only thing which is important is that, that these two nine-dimensional subalgebras that I have just shown you are parabolic subalgebras in, 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 in G2. It turns out that there is yet another parabolic subalgebra in G2, namely the intersection of the red one with the blue one. And this eight-dimensional one, and it's called Borel subalgebra in G2. So this is, this is this one that is now purple here or magenta here. And this magenta is obtained bad. And you can see that this again, eight, that, that is an eight-dimensional subalgebra. Okay, so now the question is, can I have more of these large dimensional subalgebras in G2? And the theorem is as follows. If H is a least subalgebra of G2 and dimension of H is greater than A, then either H is isomorphic to one of parabolics P1 or P2, this, or it is, entire G2. So actually what I'm just trying to say that this P1 and P2 are maximal subalgebras in, 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 in uh, are subalgebras of maximal dimension in G2. There's no bigger one. And actually there are only two modular conjugation, there are only two non-equivalent uh, large subalgebras of dimension nine, which are just this P1 and P2. I, I show you again how they look on the diagram. So that's my P1, the red one, and that's my P2. Okay. So now I, so somehow when we come back to killing statement, statement, statement of killing was that there is, there is the realization of G2, if the G2 exists, should be in five dimensional, on five dimensional manifold. So we see that there are at least two possibilities of realizing G2 on a, uh, as a symmetry group of some five dimensional manifold is either G2 by P1 or G2 by P2, okay? So now the question is, so I already know that, that this five dimensional manifold on which this geometric structure with this G2 symmetry should exist should be either G2 by P1 or G2 by P2, okay? So the question is what? are these geometric structures captured by G2 symmetry on M1 or M2? And answers to these questions give the geometric realization of the exceptional D group G2 in the lowest dimensions. There will be no lower dimensional realization, sort of, because as we know, the largest uh, subalgebra has dimension nine. 
So now I need to send to 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 to, to introduce some preparations to tell you to answer the question: What is this geometric structure on this M1 and M2? So this will be just something maybe to to abstract, but let it be. So it, it turns out that uh, that simply algebras, simply algebras, admit something which is called R, R gradations. What does it mean? It means that they can split and be split onto a direct sum of vector spaces GI, where I runs from minus R through zero to R. And so the every simple D algebra can, can be decomposed into direct sum of vector spaces numbered from G minus R to GR such that the, that this, that the split is sort of a symmetric, that every the dimension of every GI is the same as dimension of G minus I. And moreover, so this as a vector space, the Lie algebra should be just, it's always possible, a simple Lie algebra to decompose onto something like this, which is symmetric in this sense as a vector space. And moreover, the commutators between these guys, GI and GK, are such that the GI with GK sits in G, G, GJ plus K uh, when uh, J plus K is in the range from minus R to R. If it is not, it is zero. So in particular, uh, G, commutator of GR with GR is just zero. So this, 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 uh, this lateral uh, spaces in this decomposition are uh, abelian uh, algebras. Okay, so this is what I uh, wanted uh, to, to say. So that every uh, simple algebra admits such R gradations, and it turns out that, that not, not uniquely, there are, there are, there are many, in, in principle, there are many of these R gradations, but the number of non-equivalent ways of grading a simple algebra, simple algebra is well known. And <clears throat> It turns out that if you have such a simple D algebra, if you, if you, and if you choose one of these gradations, then it turns out that the part G0, G plus, which, is, which starts from G0 here and going to GR, that this is a subalgebra due to, due to this condition. And this subalgebra is actually parabolic subalgebra in G. So in a way, if you have a gradation in a simple D algebra, this defines a parabolic subalgebra there, which is just consisting of non-negative part in this decomposition. The, the, the converse of this statement is also true. A choice, if you have a simple D algebra and if you choose a parabolic subalgebra, then this defines a gradation in the simple D algebra. Okay, so that's the first story about simple D algebra. Simple D algebras admit R gradations and moreover, a choice of R gradation in a simple D algebra is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a choice of a parabolic subalgebra in this algebra. Okay. So if you are given a simple D group, it has many subgroups. And therefore, there are many G homogeneous spaces, G over H. But if it happens that this age, this subgroup is a parabolic subgroup, then the corresponding gradation, H is T, then it chooses a gradation in the Lie algebra of, the, of G. So because of this, this choice of P induces a geometric structure in G. And this in turn has G, G as its symmetry. So our, spaces M1 and M2 are homogeneous spaces for parabolic subalgebras. So somehow we can use the gradation corresponding to P1 or gradation corresponding to P2 to understand what is the structure, geometric structure on M1, which is just G2 symmetric, okay? So this, it is why I insist very much that it's P1 and P2 are parabolics because these are parabolic subgroups. So therefore they, they the, therefore, the algebra in G2 uh, corresponding to the, this choice of P1 
is just graded in a particular way. So we can now see what degradation on the algebra of G2 makes the choice of P1 and what gradation on, G, on V2 makes the choice of P2, okay? So here is my P1. P1, remember, was this red one, red one thing. And then if you only choose such, such parabolic in G2, you immediately see that the uh, entire G2 splits onto this decomposition. And this decomposition is just vectors. So for example, G0 corresponds of something like this vector, this vector, and two guys in the in the in the in the Cartan subalgebra. So there's four dimensional vector uh, vector space G0 here. There is a two-dimensional one, G1, one-dimensional one, uh, G2, and two-dimensional one, G minus three. And likewise, likewise on the, uh, there should be G3 here. And likewise on the right-hand side. Because what? Because commutators of the grays with grays are grays. Because if we add them together, they will be, we will not leave gray. We will not leave uh, uh, gray stuff. If we take commutator of grays, for example, with, 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 with orange, adding gray to orange will not go without orange because it will go beyond the, beyond the diagram. So the commutator of these guys with the grays are sitting, sitting in these guys. Likewise, adding gray to the, 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 the magenta, it will be in magenta. Adding gray to, 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 to red, it will be in red. So this definitely, this, this definitely satisfies the rules that G uh, J commutator with G K is in G J plus K, and this gives the gradation. So somehow the gradation is given by the choice how this G zero sits here. Okay. So if we so we have such gradation in in uh, G two if we choose this parabolic, and now. Uh, we can think about group G2 dividing by, divided by parabolic uh, subgroup P1. And if we just look at this diagram, so then we can just forget about the red thing and what, what uh, is left, which is just this five dimensional thing spanned by the blue, yellow, and green is representing nothing else but the tangent space uh, to M1 at some point. And this is this space, the, this, this tangent space is nothing but, but the Lie algebra G2 at every point is nothing because it's homogeneous. So at every point it is just G2 divided by this parabolic P1. And because the parabolic makes this choice of gradation, so in particular, in this what, we, what remains here, we see that there is that at every point, of this of this of this uh, uh, manifold M1, there is there is a two-dimensional space distinguished in the tangent space, and this two-dimensional space is just given by these blue vectors, which are given modulo addition of the red. And then there is also a free space distinguished because in the Lie algebra, this one-dimensional thing was distinguished, but in the quotient, actually, if we just take commutator of this guy with its equivalent adding to this, this guy, because of the commutator, we, we produce this one. So actually, what we will get now, the, in the quotient space, we have a well-defined rank, rank two space, and we have well-defined rank three space, which is just this one plus that, and we have well-defined rank five place space, which is, which is, so that's the free one. We have the blue one, which is just two dimensional at every point. We have the green, green one, which is three dimensional at each point. And we have the yellow one, which is entire tangent space. So somehow the tangent space of this manifold M1 at every point distinguish at every point a flag of two dimensional vector space sitting in three dimensional vector space and sitting in five dimensional vector space. So this shows that this space M1, which is G2 by P1 is equipped with a G2 invariant flag of 
d minus one sitting in d minus two and sitting d minus three of vector distributions with respective ranks two, three, and five. And we, we, you remember that we get in the Lie algebra, we get the green one by taking commutator of this. So somehow essentially this flag of d, d minus one sitting in d minus two and sitting in d minus three is determined by d minus one because we can obtain d minus two by taking commutator d, d minus two by taking commutator of d minus one is it safe which is with itself and we can obtain d minus three by taking let's say commutator of d minus one with d minus two right so somehow what 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 we see therefore is that this five five dimensional manifold which is just g2 divided by p1 is naturally equipped with a rank two distribution d minus one on it at every point we have distinguished two plane and this two plane is such that it's not integrable when you take it over manifold because commutator of d minus one with d minus one is d minus two and with d minus one with d minus two is d minus three so it's actually bracket generating this distribution so and this is the first lowest dimensional realization of the simple Lie group G2. It is the symmetry group of the rank two distribution D minus one having this very peculiar property that is not integrable, but it's actually maximally not integrable in such a way that if you just take a commutator of D with D, you produce something of rank three. And if you take commutator of D with this rank three, you will produce entire tangent space. So such distributions are called two, three five so this this what i have just shown is that this m1 is a five dimensional manifold which is naturally equipped with the rank two distribution actually two three five distribution and this two three five distribution by construction is g2 symmetry and this is how uh, Cartan and engel gave first geometric realization of g2 it is a symmetry group of a certain rank two distribution in the in dimension five. Okay. So now, what about the other parabolic? If we take another parabolic, we will get another five-dimensional manifold. First of all, we get another gradation. Now the gradation looks like this: gray, green, yellow, red, magenta. So, in other words, commutators of green goes to yellow, and the, the, the structure of this of this gradation is different than before. Before G0 was four dimensional, then there was G minus one, G minus two, G minus three, and G1, G2, G3. Now we have split on of G0 of G2 onto G0, G1, uh, G minus one, G minus two, G1, and G2. And now the dimensions here are, are four. As before, but now there is four here, four here, so it's already twelve, and it's one dimensional here, one dimensional here. And now, so now if we pass to the quotient, if we pass to the quotient, the five-dimensional space now will be just at every tangent space at every point to the to, to the manifold M two G two by P two will be just represented by this green yellow stuff, and now we see that now we have we have a flag of something which is just a distribution of rank four and this distribution of rank four is not not integrable and this produces uh, the entire tangent space by taking commutator for example green with green right or this green with this green <laughs> so somehow now uh, the schematic view of the tangent space to m2 g2 by p2 looks like follows that now we have a uh, <clears throat> Uh, vector space G2 by P2 uh, equipped with a, a four plane D minus one. And this four plane sits in the five plane and it can be, so now what we, what we, what we, what we see also that now there is, there is this G zero here corresponding to this alpha four, Alpha eleven and two guys in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the Cartan subalgebra. So if this G zero acts 
So what is this G0? This is a four dimensional subalgebra. We know that this one, this one, and one from this gives SL3. So this actually GL, G, G, uh, so this actually GL2R, GL2R Lie algebra, because it is SL2R plus one more, which is GL2R. So this is GL2R. And now this GL2R acts on this because our action is just by taking commutator and if we take commutator of this alpha 4 alpha 11 or 0 or 0 with the greens one we will be just saying in the green one so somehow this gl2r acts and one can see irreducibly on this four dimensional space so what we now have that on the quotient space we have rank 4 distribution which is non-integrable and it produces rank five distribution. And actually one can see that it is actually contact distribution. And moreover, we have a GL, irreducible GL to R structure in the four distribution. So that's what the structure on M2, G2 by P2. So this shows that my manifold G2 by B2 is equipped with a G2 invariant rank four distribution D minus one, which is Number one, contact, and number two has irreducible GR to R structure on it. And this is the second lowest dimensional realization of the simple Lie group D2. It is the symmetry group of the contact distribution D minus one with GL to R structure on it. So as you see, the understanding of group G2 and making its geometric realization is much more complicated than making geometric realization of these classical Lie, simple Lie groups. But here I gave you two different realizations of group G2 as a transformation group in dimension five. Number one, it is symmetry group of particular two three five distribution. Number two, it is symmetry group of contact distribution in dimension five, five such that this contact distribution is equipped with gl 2 r structure. Some particular one, so that's that's what how you can realize G two, and these these two realizations are due to Cartan and Engel, Eli Cartan and Friedrich Engel. Actually, they were published in eighteen hundred ninety three by these two gentlemen in the same journal, one after the other. Actually, so it's, it's interesting. Okay, so that's. I just finished the mathematics of the story. So it is from pure mass, you should you should you you, you will see that there are at least two different five-dimensional realizations of the group G2. And now the question is: can we see these things, which is either this story, two three five distribution in dimension five, or this contact distribution with GL2 are structure on it? naturally in some physics problems. So that's my last part of the story. So I would like now to find some five manifolds naturally appearing in physics that has this structure or this structure, okay? So first I have to choose some five dimensional manifolds. I should find, for example, a physical system with five degrees of freedom. So my Five manifolds will be configuration space of some mechanical system. Okay, so let me start with the following mechanical system. I will consider the system of two rigid bodies, smooth rigid bodies, rolling on each other. So we have just two rigid bodies in R three, which are which 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 roll on each other. So. I claim that the configuration space of the system is five dimensional. So let me, let me count it. So <clears throat> the boundary of body of first body is a smooth, smooth surface. The other is smooth surface. So to specify a position of the system, we choose a point, one point on the one surface, one point on the other surface. And these are the points in which the two surfaces kiss at each of each other at a given moment of time. So, the, so I have, so to, to, I, I'm counting degrees of freedom. So first I just, there are two plus two, meaning the coordinates of the point on one body and the other body when they kiss. So there is the points that, where they kiss. And now to fully determine the position of the system at a given time, 
one still need to fix the relative angle between the tangent spaces. So it is one coordinate because it's essentially rotation, right? So this, equi this equivalent to specify a rotation uh, identify the, identifying the tangent space. So summarizing, to specify the position of the system of rolling bodies at a given time, we need five real numbers, namely point on one surface, point on the other surface, <clears throat> uh -huh. and rotation, which is one parameter thing. So more formally, one can even say that the configuration space of the system of these two uh, rigid bo bodies rolling on each other is a circle bundle over Cart Cartesian product of this sigma one, sigma two, with fibers being the circles of orthogonal transformations. So it is how this five dimensional manifold looks like. It's actually a, a, a circle bundle over Cartesian product of the, of the boundaries of this, of this surface. Okay, so we have five, we have a five manifold. Our goal is to see G2. So we would like to identify this five dimensional configuration space with either G2 by P1 or G2 by P2. So for this, we need more structure on M, either rank two distribution, which is two, three, five, or a contact distribution with GL2R structure. So I need more, I, I, I should specify my physical problem more than I specified so far. It is not, I, I need some more structure on M. So far I have only configuration space, but the configuration space of my rolling guys is five dimensional. I need more structure, so I will say, say something more about the, the movement. So in physical terms, we should be more specific about conditions for, of, of the rolling we consider, right? So one option is to introduce constraints on the possible movements. If we, for example, introduce linear constraints on velocities, we will distinguish K planes at each point of MEM, which will be vector spaces of possible velocities of the system uh, at a given time. So because if we, if, we, if, we, if we have a configuration space, the tangent spaces at every point are spaces of possible velocities. If we restrict velocities by some linear constraints, we'll get subspaces at every point of, of the tangent space. And we need for something like this. We need for this two, three, five distribution or this rank four distribution. So, and one way of just putting more structure is saying that we will be considering movement with constraints on velocities, linear constraints on velocity. And this will define a distribution. And I would like that this should be this guy that has this G2 symmetry. Wanting that, G, that we have a G2 symmetry here, this distribution should be non-integrable. In physical terms, we need to impose linear non-holonomic constraints on our rolling. So I need to put some linear non-holonomic constraints on my movement now of my bodies, okay? So let us impose a constraint of rolling without slipping or twisting on the system of two bodies, B1 and B2. So what does it mean, rolling without slipping or twisting? There are two kinds of constraints here. First, there is no slipping, which is that when they move, they don't slip linearly they linear velocities don't slip. The velocity vectors of the two bodies at each point of contact in the reference range of this point should be the same. So that's no slipping condition. What does it mean non-twisting? It means that the relative angular velocity between these two bodies along the axis passing through their point of contact and orthogonal to their tangent plane at this point must be zero. So they cannot, they cannot slip like linearly and they cannot slip, they cannot slip uh, uh, rotational, right? So if we just think about these two conditions, the first condition, the non-slipping condition imposes two linear constraints at five dimensional vector space of velocities of the system at each point. And the non-twisting condition adds one more linear constraint. So actually this story, this non-slipping and non-twisting condition puts three linear constraints at every point on velocity. So therefore, the tangent space, the space of all the velocities is five dimensional with a free linear constraint. So this non-slipping, non-twisting conditions defines a two plane at every point. It is a two plane of possible velocities when the guys are moving without slipping or twisting. In this 
way the non-sleeping, non-twisted conditions defines point by point a rank two distribution on a manifold. This distribution we call the velocity distribution of two bodies rolling without sleeping or twisting. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so now we have the following theorem. I just, so far I was talking about any bodies and now I restrict the story to two spheres. So I have two spheres, one of radius R, capital R and the other of radius small r. And now I want that they are rolling on each other without sleeping or twisting. So we, have, we know that there is this, this non-sleeping, non-twisting non uh, condition defines a five distribution on the uh, rank two distribution on five dimensional configuration space. And this rank two distribution is just the velocity distribution. And now this, now <coughs> I therefore my, my configuration space is equipped now with rank two distribution. And this system when M comes from these two spheres, rolling on each other as the following properties that the velocity distribution d is integrable if and only if the uh, radii are the same so if radii are the same this md will be not my g2 story because for the g2 story this distribution should be not only not in it should be not only integrable but it should be not integrable in a such a way that it is two three five but then it turns out that if only R is greater than R, if they are not equal, then this D is always two, three, five. So it is a two, three, five distribution always when, when R is greater than R. And of course, this system has obvious global symmetry because the, there are two spheres. So the, 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 the system has obvious SO3 times SO3 symmetry. The point is, that among all two, three, five distributions on manifold, there could be a lot of these distributions that are locally non-equivalent. Among this locally non-equivalent one, the most symmetric one is such that has G2 symmetry. So what I have just told you is the following, that if we have these two spheres of non-equal radii, then MD is a structure of two, three, five distribution. But there are plenty of non-equivalent two, three, five distributions. What I definitely know just by looking on the system that the system has SO3 by SO3 symmetry, but it has only six dimensions. And my G2 has 14 dimensions. So I am, I would be very lucky if there could be some choice of R and R that this distribution is 235 distribution with G2 symmetry. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me go farther. The local group of symmetries of the system has dimension six, six for all R don't equal to R. So the global is six and local is also six everywhere except the case when R is equal to R. And then symmetry group suddenly jumps from six to 14. In this case, the case of two balls with radii satisfying R to R being free, the local group of symmetries of the non harmonic system is isomorphic to the split real form of the simple exceptional group G2. So if you want to have a physical realization of group G2, you may say, okay, what it is? It is a symmetry group of velocity distribution of two balls rolling on each other without slipping or twisting such that the ratio of the radii of the balls is one to three. Very strange, but true. Okay, so this, this, this somehow, it, it, for me, it was quite shocking that something like this exists because like six, 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 and now suddenly the symmetry jumps. People would say, the, 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 the geometers would say that they, this, this, this ratio one to three should be somehow visible on the root diagram of G2. Can we see it? I don't know, but. Uh, uh, Igor Zelenko gave me this funny answer. So he says, take, take a circle of radius, let's say, uh, three, and take a tangent circle of radius one inside, and then roll, and then roll. Then it is the only possible that, that they will be tangent like this. And then just connect the points of tangency Get rid 
of the thing and you will get root diagram of G2. And it happens only because I choose, I choose the radio, radius of the big circle to the small circle, one to three. I don't know if it is an answer, but it is at least funny for me. Okay. So it turns out that I know uh, three other pairs of bodies, which when rolling on each other without slipping or twisting, exhibit G2 symmetry. It is strongly conjectured by Robert Bryan that these are all. So how these other three pairs of bodies looks like with this G2 symmetry. In each, the, the, these examples are much different than the example of this ball. Uh, in each of the three additional pairs, one of the bodies is the plane. So these will be examples of one body rolling without slipping or twisting on the plane. And I claim that these three cases will have G2 symmetry. So these pairs consist of a body B1 rolling without slipping or twisting on the plane. In all three cases, the body B1 has axial symmetry. So the body rolling has axial symmetry. And the boundary, which means that the boundary of, of this uh, rolling guy on a plane is always a surface of revolution. And actually, two of these surfaces are algebraic. I can just even write algebraic equation in R3 for, for the first one. The second one looks like this. And the third one is obtained by rotating the function uh, like this one here, which is, which is actually elliptic function along the z-axis. So how do they like, look like? They look rather boring. That's, that's the one. Uh, these are these algebraic ones. This is the algebraic one with minus sign. This is the second one. This one with the hole. And that's this, this, uh, this elliptic uh, curve rotated surface. So, and it turns out that these three also have G2 symmetry as, as uh, the, the configuration space with the rolling distribution of these three guys has also local G2 symmetry. So that's, that's what I know. Now the question is, can I give you a story about geometric, not geometric, the physical realization of this G2 by P2? The answer is yes, but I have no time for this. So if you want to get a realization, mechanical realization of G2 by P2, please read my paper with Mike Eastwood. And it turns out that here the objects the mechanical objects that we, we, we consider are flying saucers. What is a flying saucer? It is a disc in a free space. It is a disc in free space. And so easily you can see that disc in free space has five degrees of freedom. So the, the configuration space of a disc is five dimensional. And now you need to put this additional condition that equips this five dimensional space with a contact distribution with GL2R structure on it. To define contact distribution is precisely this what you need to define a flying saucer, because if you just look, for example, such movies like I would say Star Wars, the flying saucers are moving in such a way that they, their velocity is always tangent to the, to the plane of the disk in three dimensions. In three dimensions, their velocity, they can, they can do very strange evolutions, but they, they, they velocity is always at every moment tangent to the plane of the disk of the saucer. And this gives you a non-holonomic condition, which defines a rank four distribution in dimension five, which will be just the velocity distribution. And then we argue in this paper how to put this GL2R structure, which we call GL2R, G2 maneuver uh, for, for, for flying saucer that equips this with this geometry of G2 by P2. So it is it is it is it is described in these two papers quite recent actually papers of mike and mine the story about rolling which i told you today is described in my paper with daniel ann and i also made an attempt with gilbor to realize g2 in lower dimension than five i my my all indoctrination today was about this that you cannot go lower than five but in certain sense you can do it we just wrote it in this paper with uh, gil and luis la moneda thank you very much well thank you are there questions um I have a couple of questions. Um, 
the, the usual way I think of G2 is as the automorphisms of the Cayley numbers or octonians. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think if you if you think about, see, how does this work? You you think? I mean, I'm trying to remember what that there are two pictures I I know. One is that picture, and one is. Uh, you look at this. You look at the spin or representation of spin seven, and you look yes. at a stabilizer of a point. Yes. And yes, correct. Correct. How, how do you relate those two? So I, I just okay. So I, two, I, I okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the very beginning of my of my talk. Yeah. That's that's a, that's a good point, and I should have mentioned this also. I should I should have mentioned all of this what you just are saying, but I didn't yes. for some particular reason. In, in the title of my talk is something which is called split real form of, ah, yes. what is of Lie group G2. Okay, so what, 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 uh, what Killing did, he classified simple Lie algebras over the complex number. Ah. Okay. <laughs> that so, was another question. <laughs> and and, and in, the, in the classification over the complex numbers, yes. there are the, the the, the situation is very simple. So that's essentially all of this. Over the complex number, that's how classification looks like. Yes. Now, if you just take classification over real numbers, there are much more non-equivalence cases. Even here, we know that, for example, yeah. SO21 is not uh, equivalent to SO3. Yeah. So over reals, yeah. there, are, there, are, there are real forms of this the algebra. Yeah. Okay. So for G2, there are two, it turns out that there are precisely two real forms for G2. For complex G2, there are two real forms. One of them is called split real form. How do you get it? Take a complexly algebra G2 and forget about complex numbers. So think about this as an algebra of a real number. Okay? So that's a split G2. Right. And another one is something which is called compact G2. Right. And it's such G2 that, that Whose, whose, whose killing form is definite, is definite. You, you cal simply algebra has, 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 has always, that's a Cartan criterion, that the simply algebra has always a killing form which is non-degenerate. Right. And among these real forms of a simply algebra, there is always one which is called compact and is such yes. for which the uh, killing form is definite. Is, is positive definite or negative definite is absolute convention, okay? It turns out that, so then G2 has actually two, actually every simple D algebra has always two, at least two real forms. One of them is right. split real form, which is just forget about complex number use on the reals, and the other ones is compact one. This is what you were saying is, a, is about the compact G2. Yes, right. And I am talking about split G2. Ah. The interesting thing is, right that right. the first ever realization of G2, of real G2, was by Cartan and Engel in 1893, and it was split real G2 and not compact real ah, G2. Ah, right, okay. okay, right. That's number one. Number two, it was, so it's 1893. It is 1907 that Walter Reichel, who I believe was student of Engel, Walter Reichel found G2, both G2, uh, split real and compact, as two open orbits uh, among three forms, right? So right. if you 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 take a three forms in dimension seven, take that that's it is why it is exceptional. Take dimension seven and take a consider three forms in dimension seven. Okay. Yeah. So three forms in dimension seven is something like I don't know, uh, uh, thirty-five dimensional space maybe. <laughs> okay. Any, anyhow, it, it turns out that the G2, if you take a randomly chosen, randomly chosen free form in dimension seven, and you look for stabilizer in GL GL seven R of this free form, this stabilizer is either G two split or G2 compact. Uh -huh. So somehow, somehow G2 can be, that's Walter Reichel, 1907. I was talking about 
realization of G2, and, and this is linear realization. So this is linear realiz realization of Walter Reichel from 1907, that G2 is a stabilizer of a randomly chosen preform in uh, R7, okay? It, but that's presumed- And then, wait, 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 wait. Then, yeah. as you say, Cartan wrote a paper in Encyclopedia about complex numbers and complex systems. And there, he realized that actually G2, as you say, is a, a symmetry uh, group uh, of the split of the of octonions of octonions, right. but there is also split octonions. So oct oct the symmetry group of uh, automorphisms of uh, octonions, usual octonions or Cayley numbers, right. are is just uh, compact G two, whereas. There is some other algebra which is called split octonions, and this automorphism is just the uh, split. Okay, so that's what, and right. all of this, what I, what, what, what you are saying, is this, this is about linear realization of G two. This first ever realization that I was talking is non-linear realization because it's a transformation group of manifolds. So not right. only Cartan on Engel gave the lowest dimensional possible realization, but also in a not trivial way that was not linear realization, but just as a transformation group of some geometric structure, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's, that's sort of gives me some, yeah. I mean, the, the, the other question is, I mean, when you look at G mod parabolic, it, I mean, if you think of the compact version of G. The, uh, in compact version, there is no parabolics. No, no, but what I mean is, yeah, sorry, what I mean is you look at the complex form. Right. So G mod parabolic, that, that by the Botbrel Vey type theorem, that's, that's embedded in some projective space. So right. can you relate these examples to those? That's, that's, that's correct. So this, 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 these examples can be also, these, these, these spaces can be understood as, as, uh, uh, as uh, Grassmannian, right? So right, that's, yeah. That's, so yes, that, that's, that's what is a modern understanding of this. But yeah. I wanted to show you this, how yeah. Cartan and Engel did it and how yeah. it directly goes to, 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 to this rolling system, okay? Yeah, but, but my, my point really was for those rolling systems and so on, I mean, you, they're all, well, I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there's some way of producing an actual representation of G. Um, you know, by inducing up from a one-dimensional representation of the parabolic, which actually realizes those, it gives you a natural way of sort of relating the, the physics to the mathematics. I mean, is, is there any way of seeing that? Uh, Are I there any know. representations I don't, I, around that? I don't know. Per, perhaps, per, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, such, such okay so there is there is a group of these people that that that, that are experts on this on this yeah. parabolic kind of geometry yeah with with the with the popes here being uh, andreas chap from vienna and uh, slovak from vienna and they they are students so they know such i yeah. think that they would right. now know such yeah, yeah. i am more physicist than than, than yeah, yeah. i'm just learning from them mathematics just to see yeah. how it works in physics okay so th but these are yeah. the people to to, to ask yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, about these uh, rolling examples, uh, were ab about which uh, which uh, real distribution? The, uh, two three five. Two three five. Two three five. And what about uh, the the other one? That's what I was saying. The other one is in the paper with Mike, Mike Eastwood. It is just flying saucer geometry. Oh, okay. That's, that's precisely, I had no time for this because already this 235 story took me a lot. But the other one is just finding this, these first two papers in this one. It is very recent, as you see, 2020. Thank you. So I, I told you already that the space is five dimensional. The space is five dimensional here because it is just to, to specify position of a flying saucer in free space, you should say where is its center and what is the orientation of the normal vector. So it is sphere times sphere times R3, right? So it's five dimensional space. And now 
you need to put some uh, linear constraints on velocity. And this constraint I put is follow is the following that the that the velocity of a saucer at every moment should be tangent to the plane of the saucer. This defines a linear constraint on velocity, one linear constraint, and this gives you a rank four distribution. So there will be your four distribution, and this will be contact distribution on these five manifolds. Now you have to define properly GL2R structure on the, this configuration space of the flying saucer. And this, this is quite tricky. How to do it? You have to put some further restriction on the movement that puts, so far my restriction was such that the saucer is moving only tangently to its, to, to, to its uh, the velocity of the saucer at every point is just tangent to the plane of the saucer. So this that that's only defines contact distribution on these five manifolds. But to have this G2 structure, this, this G2 by P2 structure on it, you have to define GL2R structure on this four dimensional plane at every point. And you have to do it by putting some more restriction on the movement. And we do it by saying that the flying saucer has a very skillful pilot, pilot that should make something which we call which we call G2 maneuver. So he can only fly on, per, on, 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 on particular curves. If he does this, this equips this GL2R thing with uh, this, this, this flying saucer configuration space with the contact distribution with G2 structure. And I, I was even laughing that we should sell this maneuver to pilots, if not to the army, to the movies, because they, these saucers do many evolutions in the movies, but never they made a G2 maneuver. OK, thanks for the suggestion. We <laughs> will see whether they, they take, it, uh, take it up. I have a question. There was, there, was an, there was another suggestion of Ian Anderson, because I said, Ian, I have these guys. What can I do with them? They are, they are cute, because they are, they are sort of the most symmetric rolling surfaces apart from spheres what can i do and ian anderson told me slice them and sell them to michelin saying that there is a profile profile for a tire because it's the most symmetric <laughs> all right uh, um Yeah, so comments or questions by somebody else? I might have a very brief question. Yes. Uh, so yeah. now it, when you have these services here, so if you make a little perturbation, then as you said, that then that this jumps like to a different uh, group. That yes. Will... yes, yes, yes. So it is not a good idea for having tires because you just <laughs> go one on a street and you just infinitesimally perturb it and you lose the symmetry. That's correct. And maybe one more question. Uh, yes, when sure. you talked about this R gradation, gradation, uh, then uh, this R is some. I mean, what, uh, you, you also had these two examples, right? Ones like R, yes, R yes, was yes, basically three, and one was two. So, what what does this R somehow um, is? What okay. does it? Uh, I, what is it determined by? Yes. Yeah, so, as I said, that every simple D algebra, so in particular G two, admits these kind of gradations that are symmetric, right? It turns out that the number of these gradations is absolutely determined by the structure of the Lie algebra. So for example, G2 has only three such gradations. And these gradations are in one-to-one -one correspondence to non-equivalent parabolic subalgebras. G2 has only three, three uh, non-equivalent parabolic subalgebras, P1, P2, and Borel, which is just intersection of P1 with P2. Other simple algebras have more parabolics. Now you can say how many, uh, so if you choose the parabolics, it defines this, this, this gradation and it defines R and all the dimensions of the, of the story. It defines, so choose of, choice of parabolics defines this uniquely. So now the question is how many of these gradations it, a given simple algebra has? The answer is quite nice. The answer is the following, take a, uh, Dinkin diagram of a simple D algebra. Okay, take a Dinkin diagram of a simple D algebra and decorate it in this way that put cross on your choice of 
nodes, nodes. So in the Nikin diagrams, there are just these bars and there are nodes. Put crosses on nodes. How many parabolic subalgebras given Lie algebra, simple Lie algebra has? It has as many parabolic subalgebras are non-equivalent distribution of crosses on this node. So G2 has only two nodes. So therefore there are only three, three uh, parabolics, okay? And three gradations and the parabolics and defined gradations. So these will answer you. And then you can calculate what, uh, the, what is the R for the given parabolic and what, is the, what are the dimensions. The, the story is that it's always symmetric. Like there are as many R's as minus R for the, that's, that's the answer, okay? But the, the, the answer, how many of them they are is as many as the, as the distribution of crosses on the Dinkin diagram, as possible distribution of crosses. So it's purely combinatoric thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions? Another last quick question. No, so let us thank Pavel for the talk. Thank you very much. And stop recording.